So uh, my topic is principles of stroke recovery and rehabilitation. Uh, let's first start identifying what a stroke is. Stroke is an acute neurological deficit due to infarction or hemorrhage within the brain or actually spinal cord and even retina lasting more than 24 hours. Uh, if it's less than 24 hours, traditionally we call them transient ischemic attacks. So that is why this 24 hour thing is there. And strokes can happen due to, uh, by two mechanisms. One is uh, ischemic uh, stroke and the other one is hemorrhage. All of us know about this. And big bulk of stroke patients are actually ischemic in origin, infarcts, and the minority, about 15% are hemorrhages. Stroke is not a benign disease. It causes death and also disability. Uh, the fractions given here are taken from one cohort, but uh, you know, different, different cohorts have different proportions here. But uh, a series of cases we looked at in NHSL by Dr. Padma Gudrad and Dr. Senekaban Sen and others uh, to see how much of strokes are coming in, what happened to them. And we understood that about 6% uh, of them uh, are dead on admission and further 19%, uh, 19, uh, were dead within one month. And out of the stroke survivors, that's about 75% uh, uh, of the all stroke patients who came into national hospital, uh, major hospitals, not only national hospitals, they analyze patients from many hospitals. Uh, half of them, out of the stroke of survivors, half of them were living with disability with some assistance and another half was living with normal function. So stroke is a burden, we understand that. It causes disability and whenever you have disabled uh, people in a society, that society cannot move forward. And uh, so our mission actually being uh, caring for stroke patients is to try and minimize the burden of stroke in the community. We know that uh, one in four people are likely to have a stroke during their lifetime. They are, uh, these statistics are very frightening. You know, this are actually World Stroke Organization propaganda last year. And we also know that stroke is the cause of death uh, standing at around third to fifth place uh, among the causes of deaths in any country. And it's a common cause of disability among adults. Whenever you have a neurological problem, disability goes hand in hand with neurological deficits. And certain uh, cohorts, we see a third being dead, a third survive with disability and another third survive without disability. And also we know that 80% of the stroke burden is in low income and middle income countries like Sri Lanka. We also know that stroke is preventable and treatable. In majority of stroke survivors, or people, patients who are coming for rehabilitation, about 90% of them have uh, 10 pre preventable risk factors. So it's preventable. And these are the stroke pathways that we normally follow them when the patient comes to hospital. Uh, acute emergency pathway is where patient comes very early, uh, where the cell, the penumbra is still there. For those who have not heard about the penumbra, penumbra is the uh, uh, brain tissue at threat for dying within the next few minutes or hours if you do not reperfuse the block, unblock the uh, clot and have the reperfusion. These are the salvageable brain tissue. And then uh, if the patient comes beyond the acute emergency uh, window, they enter subacute pathway. So they will not be worked up for uh, thrombolysis or thrombectomy, but they will be looked after like uh, any other patient, but still there are emergency measures that we should take. And there are certain patients who present late, late still in our country, even with a lot of propaganda for the stroke patients to come to hospitals as fast as possible. And rehabilitation is provided at each step. Whatever the phase they arrive to us, each step we provide rehabilitation. So it looks like stroke patients have three phases. First is acute phase. That's the phase where the doctors and the nurses and everyone is 
you know, running around, managing the patient as an emergency, trying to reperfuse, salvage in the penumbra, thrombectomy, and so on. And then the patient entered the uh, intermediate stage where this acute management is over, but still the patient is acute up to a week where you can have various complications and uh, uh, expiration pneumonias, DVTs, so the patient has to be looked after. And then beyond the week, first week, patient enters the full rehabilitation phase. That's the late phase. Uh, that's where the patient is fully rehabil rehabilitation and patient enters the rehabilitation facility. To reduce the impact of stroke on a community, what can we do? There are various measures that we can do. All of these are evidence-based. One is uh, primary prevention, risk factor modification. Secondary prevention includes fast TIA evaluation. So if someone gets a TIA, not every patient, every stroke patient is preceded with a TIA. But if, if you have a TIA before a stroke, that's a luxury because you have been warned. Now you go and get yourself checked up and then the mechanism of stroke causation is explored and fixed. So if it's cardiogenic embolism, you might start anticoagulation. If it's carotid you might go for endarterectomy. And if you think it's uh, just atherothromboembolism, then you might use uh, intensive medical treatment. And uh, acute reperfusion therapies are there. We have discussed about them. And stroke unit care, early aspirin, dual antiplatelets, high dose statins. The main topic for today, actually, the last thing is early rehabilitation. Though it has listed at the last, it should be started on the day one. This is something that we do from the beginning of the stroke to a longer period of time. And also, uh, uh, this is rehabilitation is what is necessary for the stroke patients to get back to, try and attempt to get back to normalcy, at least near normalcy. And all the other emergency measures are suitable only for a minor fraction, but a large majority of stroke patients need rehabilitation to improve their function. So now there's a question. Uh, when you see, you know, on the right hand side, you see a non contrast CT brain showing a, a left sided middle cerebral artery infarction. This is about day two or day three or you know, up to day five, looking at the intensity of the uh, hypodensity there. Now you see the patient on the other side having right sided weakness, which is corresponding to this infarct. Someone may have a question in their mind. If the brain tissue is dead, probably this deficit on the right side should not improve because the nerve cells do not regenerate. That's what we have learned. So in that case, patient cannot improve. But we know patients do improve. So how do they improve? They improve by two mechanisms. One is the stroke recovery. The second mechanism is stroke rehabilitation. Now recovery means uh, reversal of the pathology, acute pathology. Now in the acute setting, you will have cerebral edema and you'll have destruction of blood flow, metabolism changes and uh, penumbra, reversal of the penumbra due to reperfusion. So reversal of the pathology is the reason for recovery. And rehabilitation is a different concept. When, when you say recovery, it's only in the immediate period. The pathology actually is working only in the immediate post-stroke period. But when you say rehabilitation, it's a therapy-induced improvement in the function. So how do you explain when someone do some therapy sessions or exercises, repetition of exercises, how do, how do they improve? This is uh, pathologically in the brain, we call it as rewiring or relearning process. And there are changes taking place in the brain in rehabilitation, but this is induced by therapy sessions. So that's the difference between the stroke recovery and stroke rehabilitation. So stroke recovery is a spontaneous improvement in function from reversal of injury. And this is not by rehabilitation. This happens from resolution of the cerebral edema and resolution of diaschesis, meaning disruption and blood flow and metabolism of the brain and resolution of penumbra or reperfusion of the penumbra the penumbra reverse back to normalcy. And stroke rehabilitation is a different concept. There you have improvement in function attributable to exercises or therapy sessions. 
And this is explained by a function called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity means the ability of the brain to relearn uh, due to rewiring or whatever you want to call it. This happens from synaptogenesis. New synapses are formed, unmasking, new areas are taking over the function of the lost uh, uh, function. New areas in the brain takes over the lost function and alteration in the neurotransmitter patterns. So all of these are helping for the recovery or sorry, stroke rehabilitation, improvement by therapy sessions. So neuroplasticity is a concept in stroke rehabilitation or relearning or rewiring, whatever you want to call it. It is ability of the nervous system to respond to intrinsic and extrinsic stimuli by organizing its structure, function, and connections. So that's what is called neuroplasticity. Now, if you look at the mechanism of stroke recovery and neuroplasticity, there are two different concepts. You can see in the bottom, the reversal of injury, which is actually stroke recovery. And on top, you see the neuroplasticity, which is actually rehabilitation. And within the uh, block, you see the various pathologies which are taking place or reversal of uh, various uh, pathological changes on the time scale. And we also know that uh, on your left hand side, you see the brain with the lesion on the right hemisphere. And uh, in the acute recovery phase, you have the function of the left hemisphere intact or the right hemisphere is lost. After uh, rehabilitation, you see that the left hemisphere has taken over some of the functions which have been lost on the right side. And subsequently in the chronic phase, again, these functions have been transferred to the same side. And also activity induced neuroplasticity. Now this is actually an animal uh, model where uh, patients have been exposed to rehabilitation and another cohort not for rehabilitation. And you see functional MRI showing the hand area is larger of the rehabilitation uh, group versus the uh, no rehabilitation arm. So it, it shows up repeatedly, this has been tested and activity induced neuroplasticity improves uh, the uh, brain function. How can we improve the brain plasticity? By repeated activity and training triggers neuroplasticity, which modifies the central nervous system to recover functionally. Rehabilitation means repeated activity and training. So repeated activity and training can take place by two ways. One is spontaneously. If a stroke patient is discharged from the hospital and they will anyway have some daily activities to do. So naturally you get some rehabilitation. So that's, that's natural rehabilitation. But on the other hand, you can uh, get them to a stroke unit and we can go with a scientific rehabilitation session. There are goal-oriented repetition tasks under supervision by therapists, which is scientific rehabilitation. You can get, a, get them to a higher level of function. So task-oriented approach preferred over muscle-oriented approach. Earlier, there was a concept of uh, uh, improving the muscle, muscle uh, function. But now it's switched to a task-oriented approach for rehabilitation. Uh, now, uh, how, many, how many hours you should do the therapy sessions, what is the duration and how frequent you should do them? It's another question. Now, uh, 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 more therapy hours leads to better outcome. Let me know. They say 400 to 600 repetitions are necessary to have a neuronal structural changes for the upper limb. And for the lower limbs, you need about 1,000 to 2,000 steps for you to improve walking. So uh, on the other hand, we also know too much of intensity may lead to burnout. So patients get tired and might have a counterproductive. Uh, uh, you may not be able to go to the optimum, maximum peak uh, functional improvement that you're expecting. So intense therapy versus standard therapy, we know the intense therapy is good. Uh, then we have a question. What's the duration of each session and how many sessions should you do? And what's the intensity of the sessions? Now, this can change, but there's usually a uh, rule of thumb is three hours per day. That uh, three hour rule is coming from the availability of the therapists and, you know, um, for average patient. But it can change from patient to patient, the task type, physics of the patient, patient motivation and so on. So uh, 
therapies can work longer. And it's also Im important to uh, you know carry out the uh, tasks in multiple steps. So if you are looking at a particular goal of a function, and if you can divide it into small steps where you can improve first step and then go to the second step and third step and so on, finally with time you reach the goal. So this is called shaping. That's another uh, concept in uh, carrying out therapy sessions. Uh, when should you start rehabilitation after a stroke? Uh, benefits of early mobilization is known to every clinical condition. If you are going for a surgery, we want them to mobilize faster. You have less problems when you have when you are mobilizing a patient faster, even after surgery. So even after stroke, if you mobilize them faster, people assume probably there'll be some benefit. On the other hand, uh, early mobilization has uh, other issues also. So those are one of the reasons why you need to mobilize them early. On the other hand, very early intense therapy may be harmful. If you try to do intense physiotherapy within 24 hours of a stroke patient, can be harmful. So what is advice is to go with usual care within first 24 hours and then gradually increase the intensity of the therapy sessions. And if you delay the start of rehabilitation, that leads to a poor outcome. You should not be delaying too long also. So it looks as if there is a window of opportunity for rehabilitation to get the full function. Generally, first three to six months is a period that is advised, but certain tasks, certain patients, they improve even beyond six months. It doesn't mean rehabilitation stops at six months, it continues. And there are other factors also for brain recovery, intensity of the uh, 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 exercises, sessions, repetitions, duration, and manner in which you do it, task segmentation, and psychological factors and information. So there are so many other uh, uh, factors also come into play. And everyone knows about the stroke rehabilitation team. This is an interdisciplinary team where the patient is in the center and the whole group is trying to work towards the common goals that are set by uh, the whole group again with the patient in the middle. Neurophysician, uh, physiatrist is a new term for me, probably is rehabilitation specialist. Physiotherapist, occupation therapist, speech and language therapist, rehabilitation nurse, social worker, psychiatrist, counselors. And uh, first step in anything is evaluation. So when the patient is there for stroke rehabilitation, evaluation is very important. So proper evaluation. Uh, uh, history, you take good history, examine. And as if you are doing another long case, you get all the information and then you identify the functional goals and what are the areas that we can improve, how, the, how, we are going to, uh, uh, how we are going to improve the patient. This evaluation is done by all therapists from their point of views, and then they plan, and then in a common meeting, we discuss how much we are doing and what are the goals in rehabilitation in each patient separately. And sometimes various clinical instruments also being used for assessment and evaluation some of them are given here. I, don't, I will not go into the details of them. And when you plan for rehabilitation, you have to identify various problems in the patient. I have listed some of them here. Spasticity, limb contracture, aspiration, pneumonia, and so on. And there are certain aspects of care that you plan. And also you identify which therapist or who is going to act on various aspects. And uh, impairments in stroke can be gaze paralysis, field defects, visual neglect. Visual neglect means when you point uh, simultaneously two points with the two fingers to, uh, or the examiner for the patient to tell which side is moved. Patient always, even though the both eyes are open, patient says one side. So that's visual neglect. And sensory indentation is also a similar thing where you stroke uh, the skin on either side simultaneously, uh, eyes closed, uh, and patient is asked to recognize which 
side is stroked patient. The patient with sensory inattention, they identify as always as one side is being stroked, even though the examiner is stroking on both sides. So motor deficits, upper limb and lower limbs, ataxias, sensory deficits. These are certain impairments in stroke that the rehabilitation team has to work on. Again, uh, uh, upper limb uh, problems and lower limb problems, there are various uh, uh, tasks, various uh, problems, uh, rehabilitation goals that you identified and then plan for uh, therapy sessions. Now, stroke rehabilitation, there are phases. Phase one and two is actually the initial phase, acute phase. Yeah, you uh, thrombolize, so do emergency treatment. And phase two is acute stage again. Phase three is enhancement. Enhancement is uh, trying to improve whatever the remaining function of the patient. Phase four, actually enhancement is necessary for the patient to go into the phase four. Um, say, uh, patient, have, patient be able to have good sitting and standing balance in the phase three. If you can reach that and then patient go to the task reacquisition, patient need to stand up to uh, get the task reacquisition training. So patient enters the phase four and after this patient enters the phase five, that's environmental modification where you try to uh, change the environment to suit the patient. So phase three is enhancement, range of motion exercises, gentle stretching, and so on and so forth. Phase four is task reacquisition. You're trying to uh, uh, reacquire the tasks that have been lost. Once the patient has achieved the adequate sitting and standing balance, that should have been achieved in phase three. And then gait training, step climbing, various tasks the patient need to acquire. And environmental modification by fixing rails on the better side, patient's normal side, grab bars in bathrooms, water uh, health faucet on the table side, toilet chairs with arm rest, and so on. So many are there. You need to pay attention to the family. Uh, patient is being looked after by the family. So always we do not just take the patient in the center. We take the family also, the carers also, into the uh, whole uh, uh, rehabilitation process. So that improves confidence in patient and explain the disease process and so on. As I said before, very early mobilization within 24 hours from the stroke onset, assumed to be have potential benefits. That's why this trial was designed. We thought the mobility may lead to secondary complications, so we must move them faster. And there was a hypothesis that brain recovery is best in the early phase, so you must start rehabilitation from the time of the stroke onset but there can be potential harms also by uh, uh, mobilizing the patient within 24 hours. Uh, that's reduced cerebral blood flow when you try to get them seated up or standing. So this trial was a multi-centered trial, but the conclusion was not uh, the way we expected. Conclusion was early rehabilitation may worsen than usual care. So the outcome of this trial advises us to go with usual care. We really can't give intense physiotherapy within the first 24 hours. Spasticity management is a separate topic by itself. Spasticity means velocity dependent increase in the tone of the limb uh, due to increase in the stretch reflex. And this happens usually in the anti-gravity muscles of the body. And uh, in, in stroke, you get cerebral origin spasticity versus spinal origin spasticity in spinal cord injury. And uh, uh, managing spasticity uh, may improve certain patients and it can worsen function in certain patients. You have to selectively, very carefully select patients for spasticity management. Uh, there are innovative rehabilitation techniques given here. Constraint induced therapy is where when you have two arms, uh, when one arm is paralyzed, you are you tend to continue to use the normal arm. You are not happy to use the affected arm. So what you do here is uh, having a glove here on the normal side uh, so that right arm is not usable. You go with the left arm. And you have used robotics in the rehabilitation, brain stimulation by uh, 
uh, electrical current as well as magnetic field. Both are available. These are not in the guidelines, but in the research stage. Functional electrical stimulation. So constraint induced movement therapy, CIMT. What it means is you uh, immobilize a normal site and then uh, so you immobilize the normal side and the other side is the patient is compelled to use the abnormal side or affected side. Though this has been described uh, and trying to uh, uh, use on patients, patients sometimes do not abide by what the therapists say. They just keep using the normal side. So to improve, uh, there are modified ways of doing it. I'm not going into the details of that. And there are robotic assisted therapy. Again, there are two types. Uh, on the top is N effector device. The distal part of the limb, limb is uh, mechanically supported by the robotics doing physiotherapy. And the uh, bottom one is proximal limb is assisted with an exoskeleton type robotic device. So there are different types of robotic assisted therapy. And brain stimulation. Externally, we have also internal brain stimulation called deep brain stimulation, which is a surgical process. But here is non-invasive brain stimulation from externally by magnetic field on the left side. On the right side, say electrical current stimulation of the brain from externally. They all have, have been in research shown to be improving stroke impro uh, function, stroke rehabilitation. And there are other techniques uh, called rhythmic auditory stimulation. I'm going through some of the techniques that they use. And there's a thing called mirror therapy where patients given, given a, a normal side through the mirror, mirror image, uh, immobile limb as if it's moving, a visual input to the brain signaling that the other side is moving. So they are all being researched and proven to be effective. I have come to the last slide. So, uh, uh, stroke recovery and rehabilitation are two different things. Stroke recovery means uh, reversal of the pathology, and uh, which is in actually in the acute stage. There is no therapy needed for that. And stroke rehabilitation is an ongoing process, looking at the improvement of the patient uh, with the exercise program, uh, scientifically goal directed, and stepwise done by various components divided into uh, by the physiotherapists and speech therapists and occupational therapists, uh, leading to changes in the brain and relearning. Uh, uh, standalone, none can guarantee a complete recovery. A judicious combination of all this can bring better results. The, the objective or the hope is actually to reduce the long-term disability. Thank you. If there are questions, I can answer. Please sensor inattention and the visual spatial neglect both are the same or are they different? They are different. Uh, when you want to look for sensor inattention, you what you do is you ask the patient to close the eyes, and then uh, with your two four fingers you touch. Uh, say both ties, for example, at the same time synchronously. So a patient is asked to recognize which side is being stroked. Even though you are tapping on both sides, patient recognizes as only one side. That is sensory inattention. Visual inattention, a similar thing, but then you, you try to give visual stimuli, two visual stimuli from two fingers at the same time synchronously. And the patient is asked to recognize which finger is being moved. So you are moving both fingers at the same time. Patient is asked to recognize which finger is being moved. Patient says one side. That's visual inattention. So sir, when, uh, when there is visual, ne uh, visual spatial neglect in a stroke patient, is there a way of uh, differ, uh, may, uh, checking whether there's a homonymous hemianopia as well? Because when you, when you move with one side, say you ask the patient to recognize one finger, sometimes they can pick up, right? So visual inattention and homonymous hemianopias are two different things. Uh, visual inattention, you are giving uh, stimuli both sides at the same time. But when you're checking the uh, 
hemianopia is just one finger. You will be wagging the finger from periphery to center. So uh, if you cannot recognize on that side, that's homonymous hemianopia. You cannot see that image on that. Uh, that is actually patient cannot see that uh, uh, point of object. Any other questions or you could post on the chat box. Right. In the absence of any further questions, we'll wrap up today's session. And thank you so very much for Dr. Gamini Patirana. And to, tomorrow, we would like to um, invite all of you to participate in the next lecture, which will be done by Dr. Harsha Gunasekara. Thank you. Thank you, Chatari. Thank you, everyone. Bye.